You know, often at the end of Paul's letters, we see, we see that he writes greetings to those whom he knows in the city where he's sending a letter. But as we come to the end of Romans, we see an exceptionally long and detailed greeting. In fact, in the first 16 verses of chapter 16, Paul mentions 27 individuals, two families, and three churches. And that's quite a list in 16 verses. And in fact, looking at these 16 verses can present quite a challenge to the modern reader just to make it through all the names. It's a challenge to read it aloud. Now, often when we come to such a list as this, we can be very quick to pass over it. But that would be a mistake. Because remember, there is nothing in the Bible that is just there by accident. There is nothing that is just space filler. And this passage is important for us. This passage is rich in meaning and has application for us even today. Because in these verses, we get a glimpse into Paul's heart as he expresses his love and his appreciation for his friends. It's a reminder to us of how many people Paul interacted with and those he shared his life with. It's clear that as Paul had went on his many missionary journeys, he had come in contact with many people, and many of those people now lived in Rome. And so he calls them and identifies them by name, and he sends his greetings to them here in the last chapter of Romans. Now, some have thought that perhaps Paul did this in order to build rapport with the Roman church. By listing all the people that Paul knew by name, he was trying to seek a connection through mutual acquaintances. Remember, he had not yet visited Rome, and so some have thought maybe he just listed this all as a way to make connection to those few people he knew in Rome. And certainly that could be part of the reason, because in the two epistles that Paul wrote to churches he had not yet visited, both Romans and Colossians, both those books have an extended section of personal greetings at the end. But I think there's more than simply mentioning common friends here at the end of this book of Romans. Because this section provides us great insight into the characteristics that Paul valued in others. It shows us the type of things that he was appreciative of in other believers. And by looking at these character qualities, we are reminded of what should be present in our life as well. We should all be living our lives in such a way that if Paul was alive today and he knew us and he was going to write a letter and mention us, he would say these things about our life. And if our lives do not reflect these characteristics, then it's time to make some changes. So turn with me, please, to Romans chapter 16. We are coming to the final chapter of Romans as we have been studying together in this book. Paul begins his very long and detailed list of greetings, and we are reminded of the first character quality that should be a part of every believer's lives. We are to be those who are willing to serve. Verse 1 of chapter 16. Paul writes, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is at Sincrea. Now, Paul begins chapter 16 by devoting two verses to commending Phoebe. Most believe that Phoebe must have been the one who delivered the letter to the Romans as she is identified here. And that would explain why Paul commends her to the church and why he mentions her here in chapter 16. Remember, in the first century, there was no postal service. There was no FedEx. There was no way to just send a letter without sending someone to deliver it in person. And whenever Paul would write a letter to one of the various churches, he would send it with someone he trusted to deliver it in person to those whom he was sending his letter to. Because Phoebe was apparently unknown to the Romans, he provides a word about her character of why she should be trusted as the bearer of this letter. Sincrea was a city that was close to Corinth, and Corinth is where Paul was when he was writing this letter. And Paul upholds this dear woman as a model for all to follow. He identifies her as our sister. That's a powerful reminder that we are all connected in the body of Christ. We are a spiritual family. One who knows the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior is a child of God. And as children of God, we are connected to one another in the body of Christ, in the family of God, no matter where it is that we might live. It doesn't matter if a believer attends our local church or not, we are connected in the body of Christ. And so Paul, writing from the city of Corinth to believers in another city in Rome, could refer to Phoebe from another city yet of St. Crea and yet call her our sister. Paul says Phoebe is a servant of the church. The word translated servant here is diakonos. It's a general word in the Greek meaning servant, meaning one who serves. But it's also translated deacon in two passages in the New Testament. 
Now, the normal use of this word it was to refer to servants, most often to refer to household servants, those who waited on tables, those who served and met physical needs. That's the way it's used most often in the New Testament. It's the way John uses it in his gospel. Paul has used this word in Romans in that way. He used it back in 13 to refer how the government is a servant of God. Chapter 15, he even referred to Christ as the deaconos, the servant of the Jews. Context determines if it is referring to a servant in the general sense or if it's referring to the office of a deacon in the very technical sense. Now, there are actually only two passage in the, passages in the New Testament where most English translations translate this word as deacon. In Philippians 1.1, where Paul says to the elders and deacons of the church of Philippi, and then in the passage in 1 Timothy where Paul lays out the qualifications of a deacon. Everywhere else, in most English translations, they translate it as servant. And I think the New American Standard and the vast majority of English translations have correctly translated as servant here. There are a few who translated as deacon, but I think that is an incorrect translation. Because this is not a statement about an office in the church. This is rather about how this dear woman Phoebe was an outstanding servant in her local church. And this is what we are all called to be, regardless of whether we be male or female. It doesn't matter if we have an official title or not, we are all called to serve. And that's why deaconos is used throughout the New Testament, not just to refer to one particular office, but to a character quality that is to be present in the lives of each and every believer. Paul upholds Phoebe as a model to follow and how it is that we are to serve one another. And he entrusted this precious book to be delivered to the Romans by the hand of Phoebe. You know, those who would suggest that Paul was a male chauvinist have clearly never read the New Testament because Paul did not diminish women in any way. He upheld them as equals, which is very clear in this passage. Because in this list of friends and those who should be honored and those he was thankful for, he lists many women. It was a huge honor to be entrusted with the delivery of Scripture for the first time to a church body. And Paul entrusted Romans to Phoebe because he valued the ministry of both men and women. He goes on in verse 2. It says, "...that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints." that you help her in whatever matter she may have need of you. For she herself has also been a helper of many, and of myself as well. Paul instructs the Romans to receive Phoebe in a manner that is worthy of the saints, that they, she should be shown great love, great hospitality, to give her any help she might need. If she needed financial assistance, they were to provide it. If she needed lodging, they should provide it. If she needed meals, whatever she might need as she arrived in Rome, they were to take care of her. Paul says, she has been a helper of many, including myself. And that phrase, helper of many, in the Greek is a single word, prostat, prostatus. It means helper or patron, benefactor. It describes one who would contribute to the financial needs of another. Phoebe was one who served and cared for others. She was constantly looking out for the needs of those around her. And now the Romans were called upon to show that same type of love and care and assistance for her. They were to be her benefactor. They were to take care of her as she arrived in Rome. And we are reminded even in this that all believers are called upon to serve one another. We are to seek to meet the needs of those in our church as well as those outside our church. Phoebe models a servant's heart. We see that she was known as a servant within her local church and also to those who were outside her local church. Paul had benefited from her care as he was a visitor. Romans were now instructed to show this same love and care and concern for a woman they had never met, but they were to show her love and hospitality because they were connected in the body of Christ. To be a faithful follower of Jesus is to be willing to serve one another. And we are to be those who view ourselves as servants and understand that that is who we are. We are not masters. We do not lord our positions over one another. Rather, we are called to serve because that is the heart of our Lord and we are His disciples. Jesus said this in Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 43. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. We are to be those who serve others, who consider ourselves but slaves. That's something most of us don't like to consider ourselves as. But that is how we are to view ourselves in relationship to one another. We are to seek the welfare of others even ahead of our own. That's what Jesus modeled. That's what he called all of his disciples to do as well. 
And it's what Phoebe understood, and she lived it out before others to see. One other note that we see here is that we are reminded it is important to recognize those who serve, to thank them when we have the opportunity. Paul mentions Phoebe by name, not only to commend her, but also so that others would be encouraged to follow after her model, so that she could be honored for her service. While none of us are to serve for the applause of others, it's still good to thank those who serve so selflessly. For those of you that were with, uh, with us at the church camp out this past week, we saw some great examples of servants. Every meal, people just jumped in and helped. There was always more than enough hands to do the work around. And it was a beautiful thing to see as the body of Christ comes together and serves. It is a great thing to be with one another and to serve one another. That's what it is to be a part of the body of Christ. And that's what we are reminded of here. As we continue, we are reminded that a faithful follower of Jesus Christ will also be one who is willing to sacrifice. Look at verse 3. Greet Prissa and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who for my life risked their own necks, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Also greet the church that is in their house. Prissa is another form, another spelling of the name Priscilla. And Priscilla and Aquila are a couple that are mentioned quite often throughout the New Testament. Paul first met this couple in Corinth, and we see their interaction in the book of Acts. They were a Jewish couple who was forced to leave Rome because of the persecution of the Jews. This couple were tent makers, as Paul was as well, and they became fast friends. And the couple came to faith in Jesus Christ after Paul shared with them the gospel, and they became an amazing couple that the Lord used to spread the gospel in the first century. Paul took this couple with him to Ephesus, and then he left them there to minister in the city of Ephesus while he traveled on. We're told in Acts that in Ephesus, Priscilla and Aquila met Apollos, and they shared with him the gospel and led him to faith. And Apollos went on to be a powerful preacher in the first century. The couple eventually returned to Rome where they were living when Paul wrote the epistle to the Romans. Later on, they moved back to Ephesus. This was a couple that got around quite a bit in the first century. They moved around from city to city. They were a well-known couple in the early church, from Corinth to Ephesus to Rome. They ministered to Paul. They discipled Apollos in the faith. Now, in four out of the six times that this couple is mentioned, Priscilla's name is mentioned first. And some want to make a very big deal of that and suggest that meant Priscilla was a pastor or that meant that she was the real spiritual head of the couple because her name is most often mentioned first. But the reality is that is going far beyond anything that we should read in to order of names. In fact, that contradicts other New Testament teaching. And both Luke and Paul, while they do refer to Aquila and Priscilla, or Priscilla and Aquila, then they also refer to Aquila and Priscilla. They interchange the order of the names. So to read anything into the order of names and make a theology out of it is to just read into something that just is not there. There doesn't seem to be any hidden meaning at all. It's to the order of these two names. Maybe Priscilla was the more vocal of the two, and that's why she was more often mentioned first. But even that's reading a lot into the order of the names. What we do know is that they were a godly couple. And clearly they were serving the Lord faithfully, and many were aware of their service. And Paul refers to them as his fellow workers. That's quite an honor for Paul to call someone a fellow worker. Notice that he doesn't consider them as less important than himself. And just because they weren't apostles, just because they uh, did not have the ability to speak for God, he does not in any way diminish their role. He refers to them as his fellow workers. That is, Paul viewed them on the same level as he did. We learn that they risked their own lives to St. Paul at some point. Now, that story is not recorded for us anywhere in the book of Acts. We don't know when this event took place. We don't know the details of it. But clearly at some point, this couple was willing to sacrifice their own lives to save Paul. And for that, Paul was ever grateful, as were all the churches who benefited both from Paul's ministry and their own. What we see in this couple is that wherever they went, they were a blessing to others. And we see that they were willing to sacrifice. They were willing to sacrifice their own lives to help another. We know that they opened up their home to Paul in Corinth. We read here they had a church that gathered in their home in Rome. This was a couple who sacrificed. They sacrificed their personal space for others. This would not have been an easy thing to host a meeting of the church on a regular basis in your own home. They sacrificed their personal finances. They sacrificed their time for others. Then they remind us that faithful followers of Jesus Christ are those who are willing to sacrifice. 
And it's appropriate for us to ask ourselves, are we willing to sacrifice as we read this couple did? Are we willing to sacrifice to risk our lives to save another? Are we willing to open our homes to others? We are to be those who sacrifice our desires for the benefit of others. Now, as Paul continues, he goes into a very long list of his friends, some of whom he shares some details about, others whom he says nothing but their name. But there's a theme we see repeated over and over again in this list, and that is these men and women were known as hard workers in the ministry. They were serious about their walk with Christ. They were growing in their love of the Lord, and it was revealed in the way in which they treated others. And so we see a third principle this morning, and that is to be a faithful follower of Jesus, we must be willing to sweat because being in the ministry, being a servant of Jesus Christ involves hard work. Look at the end of verse 5. Paul says, Greet Epinetus, my beloved, who is the first convert in Christ from Asia. Epinetus is not mentioned anywhere else in the New Testament, much like most of those who are listed here. But we are told that he was the first convert to Christ from Asia. And Paul refers to him as my beloved. That is a very close term. It's an intimate term, saying he is a beloved friend. He's a close friend of his. Now, we know Paul was the first missionary to Asia, and so Epinetus must have been his first convert as he ministered in Asia. And this dear man had come to faith under Paul's ministry some years before, but even though time had passed, Paul still knew where he was living, and he sends his greetings to the one who is still living out his faith. Verse 6, he says, Greet Mary. Who has worked hard for you? Now, Mary was a rather common name, both among Jews and even among Gentiles. So there's no reason to connect this Mary to any other Mary in the New Testament. In fact, even if you tried to do that, there's a lot of Marys mentioned in the New Testament. There's no, we know nothing exactly who this Mary was. But we are told one thing about her. That is that she has worked hard for you, the church. That Greek word translated worked hard is kopeo. It means to work hard, to labor under extreme fatigue, to be tired or wearied. This dear woman had labored with great intensity on behalf of the church at Rome. Now, we're not told the exact nature of her labor. Maybe she was busy caring for the sick and the needy. Maybe she was working with children or the elderly. Maybe she was doing something behind the scenes. Maybe she was teaching and leading Bible studies. We don't know what it is that she was doing. But whatever she was doing, she was giving it 100%. So much so that her labor could be described as being intense, working to the point of exhaustion. Being a faithful follower of Jesus Christ means you're willing to sweat a little in your labor for the Lord. The reality is there is nothing easy about caring and serving for others. It takes hard work to look out for the interest of others, and that's what we're called to do. It's hard work to minister to the church body at large. It's hard work to serve behind the scenes when no one sees what you're doing. Those who each week teach Sunday school classes and take care of the nursery, they work hard at what they do. Those who are part of the worship team work hard putting in hours practicing to lead us in worship each week. Ministry involves hard work. So we shouldn't be surprised that if we volunteer for something, we find out that it involves some labor because that's what it is. It takes work in the church to get things accomplished. That's what service is. Service leads to sweat. And we should prepare ourselves and then dive into the work that is before us. Because what we see is these believers are commended for their hard work. And that should be something that could be said of all of us. Mary is commended for her hard work here. And then we see several others in this list also mentioned for their labors. And I think that stands as a reminder to us. There is nothing easy about being a follower of Jesus Christ. We ought to be prepared to give our all and to work in His service. He goes on in verse 7. He says, Greet Andronicus and Junius, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are outstanding among the apostles, who were also in Christ before me. Again, we know nothing of these individuals beyond their mention here. Most understand that Junius is a woman's name. It's uh, most likely a feminine form. And so if so, then that most likely means that this was a husband and wife team. We're not certain, but that seems to be the indication. Paul refers to them as kinsmen. That word could be used in one of two ways. It could mean that they were his blood relatives, or it could mean that they were simply his fellow countrymen, his fellow Jews. Context is the only way to know which way this word should be interpreted. Now, Paul used this same word earlier back in chapter 9 to refer to his fellow Jews, all Jews, as his kinsmen. 
Here in chapter 16, he's going to list six different individuals and refer to them as his kinsmen. Some understand that all of these people he refers to as kinsmen were actually his blood relatives. And that could be, but I think it seems much more likely that this is a very tender way of referring to his fellow Jews. Paul felt a special connection to other Jewish believers and he identifies them as such here. Paul says these two were his fellow prisoners, meaning that they shared time with him in prison. And one of the many opportunities that Paul had to spend time in prison, apparently these two joined with him. Clearly they had become dear friends. They had went through a trying experience together. And he describes them as outstanding among the apostles. Now, that does not mean that they were considered to be in the office of apostle. That's not what this phrase means. Rather, he's referring to that they performed outstanding service among the apostles. In other words, their testimony had been validated in the presence of the apostles. Paul says, they were in Christ before me, meaning that they came to Christ before Paul did. And clearly, the apostles knew of their testimony. So that means this couple must have lived in Jerusalem. This was a godly duo, likely husband and wife, who had an outstanding testimony, who came to Christ before Paul did, had lived in Jerusalem, and others had seen their testimony for Christ. They had been faithfully serving the Lord for many years, living out their faith with integrity. They spent time with Paul in prison. The apostles knew of their faith. Dear saints, living out their life, and their faith was evident to those around them. Reminder to us that there were ordinary people in the first century who came to Christ and who Christ used. Christ didn't only use Peter and Paul and the apostles and those that we read of in the New Testament. We were reminded that there were ordinary people who came to faith, ordinary people whom God used to change the face of the world, those who lived as testimonies to His power. And the same is true today. And as the Lord used these individuals to share the gospel and bring others to faith, so He uses us when we walk faithfully with Him. He goes on in verse 8. Greet Ampelitus, my beloved in the Lord. In one of the earliest Christian catacombs in Rome, this name, Apollitus, is inscribed. Now, we don't know if that was the same individual as Paul mentions here, but the tomb is elaborately decorated, indicating that the man was held in high esteem by other believers. And clearly this man was also held in high esteem by Paul because Paul identifies this man as my beloved in the Lord. Again, a very special term of endearment. And according to historians, this name, Apollitus, was a slave's name. And that's very interesting because we see Paul here greeting one whom the rest of society would tend to neglect. And he not only sends his greetings, he calls him my beloved friend. It's a reminder to us that Paul did not care if someone were a slave or if they were a member of Caesar's household. Mm -hmm. Social levels did not matter to the Apostle Paul. In Christ, we are all family. And Paul reminds us of that here by referring to who, a person who is most likely a slave and referring to him as his beloved. Verse 9. Great Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Stachys, my beloved. Again, notice the term fellow worker and beloved is used to describe these individuals. Paul highlights again this concept of working alongside others. He didn't lord his position of apostle over others. He didn't consider everyone to be his servant. Rather, he looked at those who were serving Christ as his fellow workers, as those he worked side by side with. These men were known by their fruit. It was revealed what was in their heart by the way in which they lived their lives. To be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ will be reflected in our lifestyle. Verse 10. Greet Apelles, the approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. The Greek word approved there is dokimos. It means genuine, that which is approved by testing. The word was used in other contexts to refer to the testing of metals, something that you do to prove they're genuine by putting them in the fire. It was a word used in a figurative sense to refer to going through the testing of a fire and being proven genuine and true and pure. So it appears here that Apelles had gone through some trial that apparently others were aware of. And he had been proven genuine in his faith as a result of the test. And Paul reminds all of those there of this. What he did, how he responded to the test in his life, verified that he belonged to Jesus. To be approved is not a pleasant process for anyone. It's never fun to go through the fiery test that proved that our faith is genuine. And yet, when we go through those experiences, it demonstrates both to ourselves and to others 
that we belong to Jesus. And Paul commends him for he had been approved. He had gone through a test or a trial and it had shown the genuineness of his faith. He sends his greetings to those of the household of Aristobulus. Now, this could be a reference to the entire family or perhaps a church that was associated with his family. Some here have seen a connection to the, great, to the grandson of King Herod, for the grandson of King Herod's name was Aristobulus. But we're not sure if there was a connection or not. What is clear is that the entire household was dear to Paul. Paul knew a lot of people, and he cared about them personally. He goes on in verse 11. Greet Herodian, my kinsmen. Greet those of the household of Narcissus who are in the Lord. The name Herodian seems to indicate that this individual was somehow related to Herod's family. But notice Paul refers to him as a kinsman. So that means either he was a blood relative of Paul or he was a fellow Jew. Herod was not a Jew, and so this doesn't seem to be referring to a direct relative of Herod. More likely, he was a slave, somehow connected to the Herodian family, and that's how he got his name. We aren't really certain who this was, other than Paul identifies Herod as his kinsman. And Paul sends his greetings to the household of Narcissus. Now, he doesn't send his direct greetings directly to Narcissus, but to his household, the same as he did to the household of Aristobulus. And many believe that's because these two men were either unbelievers, and he's only talking about their household, or perhaps they had already died. We don't know. There's a lot of guessing that goes on if you read commentaries when all you see is a name. What we do know is that Paul sends his greetings to their entire household which leads me to conclude that these men were believers as well and their households had followed with them in faith. Just like we read in Acts how the Philippian jailer and his household came to faith. Clearly these were households that were following Jesus Christ and Paul sends his greetings to them. He goes on in verse 12. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, workers in the Lord. Greet Persis, the beloved, who has worked hard in the Lord. These are three women's names and they are highlighted here for the quality of being hard workers. These dear women, just like Mary, are mentioned specifically for being hard-working women in the Lord. Paul once again highlights their dedication and their service for the Lord. These were dear saints who worked tirelessly serving the needs of others. And they were known for being hard workers. That is quite a reputation that we ought to seek to have. They were devoted to serving the needs of others and everyone knew that to be true because Paul could mention them in this way. It's a reminder that being a faithful follower of Jesus Christ means that we are those who work hard at what we're doing. These women were commended for being hard workers. All that, that could be said of each one of us. We should all live our lives in such a way that if someone were describing us, they could describe us the way that Paul does these ladies, as those who work hard in the Lord, as those who are fellow workers, as those who are beloved. Paul goes on in verse 13. Free Rufus a choice man in the Lord, also his mother and mine. Rufus is referred to as a choice man in the Lord. The Greek word that's used here is ekletos. It means chosen or selected, but also means choice in the sense of the best of its kind. And it seems, given the context, that Paul is using this word in that last meaning of the word. He's referring to Rufus being an exceptional man, an outstanding Christian. He was one whom stood out as a fine Christian man among men. Paul sends his greetings to this fine man, and he sends his greetings also to his mother and mine. Now that phrase does not mean that this was Paul's brother. It does not mean that they shared the same biological mother, but rather that at some point, the mother of Rufus had acted as a mother to Paul. Apparently in one of his journeys, he had encountered this family, and this dear mother had taken care of Paul and sort of adopted her into their family. And now, he could refer to her as my mother as well, and he sends his greetings to them. Now, there is a possible connection to another Rufus that's mentioned in the New Testament. Mark wrote his gospel from the city of Rome, and he wrote it after Paul wrote his epistle to the Romans. And in Mark's gospel, we learn that a man named Simon of Cyrene was the one who was forced to carry the cross of Jesus in the day in which he was crucified. And Mark provides a very interesting detail in his account in Mark 15, 21. He says this, They pressed into service a passerby coming from the country, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. Now, the fact that when Mark writes this, he refers to Simon as the father of Alexander and Rufus 
implies that Alexander and Rufus were known to those he was writing to. Otherwise, there's no reason to mention, by the way, he's the father of Alexander and Rufus. The scholars have long concluded then that the Rufus mentioned by Mark was the same Rufus mentioned by Paul because Paul was writing to the Romans and Mark wrote from the city of Rome. And if so, then that means the Rufus that Paul sends his greeting to was the son of the man who carried Jesus' cross in Jerusalem. If that is so, then clearly that day had quite an impact on Simon and his family. You know, the Bible never tells us explicitly what happened to Simon after he carried Jesus' cross. But if that's what took place, if this is the same Rufus, then clearly he must have came to faith, likely from what he witnessed that day. Then he must have led his family to faith as well, because it's not just Rufus who's mentioned, but Rufus' mother as well. I think it's a powerful reminder of the impact fathers and mothers have on their children. That day that Simon came face to face with Jesus clearly changed him, and he clearly passed on his faith to his family. His son is known as an exceptional Christian by none less than the Apostle Paul, which is quite words of praise if the Apostle Paul says you're an outstanding Christian. It's a reminder that we are called to pass our faith on to our children. We're to share with our children what it is that we've learned. Clearly Simon did, as Rufus is mentioned here. He goes on in verse 14. Greek and Syncritus, Philagon, Hermes, Patrobas, Hermas, and the brethren with them. We know nothing of these men outside of what they're mentioned here. But apparently they were all members of one of the local churches for Paul mentions and the brethren that are with them. And we are reminded in this passage that there wasn't just a single church in Rome. There were many churches. They normally met in houses that were scattered around the city. Now, the early church normally met in homes, but that's not because meeting in a home is somehow a more biblical place for a church to meet. It's simply because that was the only place they could find to meet. They met wherever they could. We see in Acts, sometimes they met outside, sometimes they met in homes. They, they met wherever they could find a place to gather together. If Paul were to write today to the church in the Rogue Valley, he wouldn't be referring to just a single local assembly, but to all the churches that corporately together make up the church that is in the Rogue Valley. And so it was in Rome. And we see that in these verses, Paul sends his greetings to all the small churches that he knew of that were gathered in the city of Rome. He goes on in verse 15. Greet Philogus and Julia and Narius and his sister and Olympus and all the saints who are with them. And we see here another church is mentioned by ind these individuals and the saints who are with them. We know nothing else about these individuals. Remember that saints is simply another word in the New Testament for believers. So when Paul writes in all the saints who are with them, he's not talking about the exceptionally holy people that are with them, but with all the believers who are gathered with them. All believers in Jesus Christ are referred to in the New Testament as saints, as brethren, as children of God. If you know Jesus as your Savior, then the Bible declares you are a saint. You are a holy one. You are one who has been set apart for His service. But if you are here and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, then you are not yet a saint. But you can become one even this very day. And if you would like to speak to someone how you can receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then please see me after the service. Paul continues in verse 16. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. The practice of greeting one another with a kiss was a cultural expression of honor, of respect and affection. This is not referring to a romantic kiss. It's not referring to kissing someone on the mouth. Such things were reserved for married couples alone. This is referring to greeting a beloved uh, family member, greeting them with a, a way of affection, with an embrace, with a kiss on the cheek. Not unlike many cultures still practice today if you go to the Middle East. Now, Paul says, greet one another with a holy kiss. And he's encouraging the believers in Rome to greet one another warmly as members of one family, as those who care deeply for one another. But this does not mean that today we should go around and kiss, kiss each other in the church. In fact, in our culture, a handshake, perhaps a hug, have replaced the kiss as a greeting. In fact, to kiss a person at church would probably give the opposite effect and would repel someone and make them feel very uncomfortable, very opposite of what Paul is intending here. I believe that the best application of this verse in our culture is simply to greet one another with a warm handshake, with a genuine smile. So don't worry, you're off the hook. You don't have to go around kissing anyone. 
It's a, it's a hug when appropriate. Greet one another as you would greet a close family member. That's the sense culturally of this command. For that is who we are in the body of Christ. We are family. And Paul reminds the Roman believers of this truth. And he says, greet one another like you would greet a beloved family member. And he say, reminds them that all the churches greet those who are in Rome with warm affection. These 16 verses are not just a list of names that we quickly skip over and keep on going. They provide a powerful reminder to us of how we're to be living in our lives. We're to be those who are willing to serve others, just like Phoebe was. We're to be those who are willing to sacrifice for others, like Priscilla and Aquila. We're to be those who are willing to sweat as we work hard in the ministry, like Mary and Paris and all the others who are mentioned in this passage. We are reminded of the deep love and appreciation that Paul had for others. And I think we should pause and examine our own lives and ensure that we have that same type of love and appreciation for other believers that Paul clearly had. Paul lived out what he taught. We in the church are family. We are connected one to another. He knew these people. He shared his life with them, and they were dear to him. We need to walk as Paul did. We need to have good friendships with other believers, those that we can share our lives with, so that we can be encouraged, and then we can also encourage others. We need to be those who are faithful, living lives as these individuals that he mentioned. For as we do that, we give him the glory that he deserves. So I encourage you this week to take some time to meditate on this passage, one that's probably most unlikely to spend some time in your devotion on, but spend some time on it. See how you might apply these truths to your life. See, are you living the way these dear people lived? Are you appreciating others the way Paul so clearly appreciated his fellow believers? And may it be said of all of us, they are a hard worker in the Lord. For that is a high word of praise for any of us. Let us pray.